All right. Well, I read through the biography that um, Debbie um, Lani sent me, and I was really impressed, and I'd like to read the whole thing, but I won't. I'll read some of uh, information about her. I think most of us have seen her name in the Northern Gardener. She writes uh, on a regular basis for that. But she's employed by uh, Bailey Nurseries, has worked there for 28 years. And the last since January 2015, she has worked as project development manager. And that means she's responsible for Bailey's new breeding farm in Georgia, as well as working with breeders around the world, bringing new plants to Bailey uh, brands. And she's also an avid gardener, has a collector's garden full of hostas, daylilies, and perennials, and also many new annuals. And um, she considers herself a plant geek, she says. Um, she is a member of several organizations, and one uh, for me that stood out is the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association. She just finished her last two years as the president, and she was recently honored by being inducted into the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association Hall of Fame, being the first woman to join that prestigious group of volunteers. And her garden writing, as I said, in a Northern Gardener, she writes a regular plant to pick article for each uh, issue. And she, <laughs> excuse me, has also written and revised editions of growing shrubs and small trees in cold climates, as well as growing perennials in cold climates. I'm really looking forward to the presentation and Debbie Lani, we welcome you to our group and look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. So I'm just going to do a couple technical things here to see if I can get my slideshow up and running. So do bear with me. All right, slideshow from the beginning. And I need to, are you, Sue, can you tell me, are you seeing the screen, screen correctly? Um, you want to no. switch screens. Uh, I'm having a hard time seeing my task bar, but here I think I can, there we go, swap presenter view. Okay, <laughs> all right, so now I can talk. So uh, we're going to talk about new shrubs for Northern Gardeners tonight. This is a lot of what I do at Bailey Nurseries now as product development manager, even though I came up through the perennial department there in the annual department. And a, a lot of what I'm gonna show you tonight, selfishly, are Bailey introductions, but I do have some proven winners and I think a couple other things to show you. There's just a lot of exciting work happening in the world of new shrubs. So, um, you know, put your, your uh, questions on the chat. A lot of these slides have some information if you want to jot down. Uh, I have a tendency to throw out botanical names. That's the good Catholic in me coming out. But uh, many of our plants now have uh, what we call trade names, uh, things that are easy to remember when you go shopping for them. So for example, here is quite an unusual plant that not a lot of people know about. It's called Seven Sunflower. And this is a cultivar called Tian Shen, named after a, uh, a Chinese uh, in China, a mountain range. And um, it's a compact form of Seven Sunflower, which grows about 25 feet tall, typically in the landscape. And uh, this is a variety that we got from a nursery in uh, France. It has multi-season interest. Actually, lots of the interest comes mid to late summer and into the fall. This is a plant that actually blooms in late summer when few other trees bloom. And this white flower in this picture you see uh, is the flower. Um, it's a lovely white flower. And the one thing you need to know about it is that I have never seen a shrub that attracts more pollinators than seven sunflower. When that plant is blooming, the bees are buzzing, the butterflies and the moths have come. So if you're looking for pollinators, this is something to think about. And um, 
And then those flowers turn into these red bracts. And if you notice the leaves there in that picture, that's the beginning of the fall color. So you get this yellow fall color, but you get these red bracts that look fabulous in the autumn. And one other thing this plant has that I don't have a good picture of right now is some really cool bark. So this is going to get about 10 feet tall in a Minnesota landscape. You know, we have a test block down in Cottage Grove. We've had it down there for 10 years and it's about 10 foot tall. It can be sold as a multi-stem shrub or if you wanna prune it up a little bit so you get that tree look to it, you can make it look like a small tree in the landscape. Now, if you noticed on the first slide, it said zone five. That's because the state of Minnesota, the ag department has something to say about how we label plants for hardiness. And we cannot talk the ag inspector into designating it as zone four. But I can tell you the original plant from France has been down there for 10 years and done exceptionally well. So if you're willing to take a little bit of risk, especially if you're inner city and you need a small tree, Tian Shen might be a good size shrub for you. I have a couple potentillas to uh, show you tonight. I have a number of plants that come from a wonderful nursery up in Canada called Jeffrey's Nursery. Dr. Wilbert Ronald, who used to teach up there at university and he continues to breed. And over the years, he's really one of the biggest experts in the country on potentilla. He has brought us a couple orange flowered varieties. This is a single flowered form. So it has those five petals and it's an orange variety called Mandarin Tango. And this is a huge improvement on the industry standard, which is out there, which is called Mango Tango. So easy to grow the potentillas. I know some people think they're kind of, I don't know what, but how many shrubs do we really have that bloom all season long? You can't really talk about a lot of them in potentillas, for, especially for gardeners that don't have green thumbs like you guys. These are great flowering plants for all summer long. Now, sometimes when we get really hot in the middle of summer, the orange will fade out to a little bit of yellow. But then when we cool down, August nights when they cool down, we get this fabulous orange color. And of course, these start in June. They are small, two to three foot tall, two to three foot wide. And that's pretty important for a lot of landscapes these days, single city lots. Um, large shrubs are just not really selling these days because people don't have the room for them. So potentillas really are great for full sun sites. They're very easy to grow. You can prune them back in the spring and then leave them go. They have no major pests or disease issues. And then uh, he, when he brought us Mandarin Tango, he also brought us Marmalade. So up in Canada, there has been some breeding for little double flowered potentillas. So they have an extra set of petals. They're really cute when they first start to bud up. The, the little flowers look like little rose buds. But this one is called Marmalade, which is an even more intense orange color than Mandarin Tango is with all the same attributes, that same size. Both of these are hardy up into zone two and none of us wanna live in zone two cause that's really cold. Um, and, and they're also deer resistant. So, you know, these are great full sun plants that give us flowers all season long. If you're looking something for very, very easy to grow. Now, this is one of my favorite, favorite new shrubs. This just came out about a year and a half ago from Bailey Nurseries. Again, this is from Canada, but it actually came from Newfoundland, from a professor there in the university. And it was found in the wild. And this is actually a little willow or a salix. And there are a few little willows that we grow in Northern gardens, but none of them have this incredible silver foliage. I, I just think this is such a nice accent plant in the landscape. And again, it, it's not real big. On the slide, it says five to seven foot. Well, we haven't seen it go to seven foot. We think if you get down next to Kansas City or Chicago, it might go that tall. In Minnesota, it's gonna go four to five foot tall and about as wide. And it's very self branching. It's very easy to grow, has this powdery silvery foliage that's quite attractive. And it's great if you put it with something that's yellow, like a yellow shrub or a purple leaf shrub. 
Um, and in the spring, you get these great little catkins on them that just, and we've just gone through that phase here. So that's kind of a late April thing here in the Twin Cities. Uh, all the salix that we grow are tolerant of moist soil. So if it, anybody has a site that doesn't drain so well, it might be a plant that does very well for you. So to me, that's a pretty exciting different plant. This is a new sorberia, also known as false spirea, and it's a variety called matcha ball. And it was brought to us by a, a different Canadian breeder, a wonderful uh, plantsman up in, on, uh, no, in Quebec. And this is a really compact plant. And I think you're gonna kind of see that as a theme throughout this shrub talk tonight. Small shrubs are quite popular right now, but, if you know regular false spirea, here's the big Latin name, Sorberia sorbifolia, it can easily get five, six, seven feet tall and is wide in the landscape. There's one really bad aspect to it. It suckers quite badly. Now, if you wanna hold a hill from the soil falling down, that's the plant for you. This is a compact form that doesn't get taller than two or three feet just a little bit wider and it does not sucker. So this picture was taken, we have a wonderful trial block down at the greenhouse range in Cottage Grove where we test plants, we propagate them, we put them in a pot, we put them in the ground to see what they're gonna do in your landscape. And, and they're so tight and compact. And when they emerge in the spring, you get some really nice colors uh, to the new growth, kind of a red to orange to peachy color. Um, it doesn't hold that color all season long. It comes on in the spring and then as the heat of the summer comes on, it turns into more of a lime green to it, but it's a very easy plant to grow. Doesn't need any shaping or pruning of any type and it's great in small spaces. Uh, this is a, another Canadian import from Jeffries from Dr. Wilbert Ronald up there. This is a compact Miss Kim Lilac called Little Lady. Miss Kim is one of my very favorite lilac shrubs. It's not a French hybrid. It is a species. It, to me, it is one of the most fragrant lilacs in May, but it can get large. It can easily go seven, eight foot tall and wide in the landscape. And so Wilbur did some breeding to get the size down. So we're talking about a plant that's more in the four foot range. This is a very young plant in his trial plot up near Winnipeg, not quite mature enough to have flowers all over it, but ultimately that plant will be covered with those beautiful uh, lavender flowers. They start out more of a darker pink bud and then they open up and the fragrance will just knock your socks off. Very easy to grow loves full sun, hardy to zone two, and again, more compact habits. So if you have a foundation where you can't use a really large Miss Kim Lilac, this dwarf form would be worth trying out. Just hitting the market. You may not see a lot of it here in spring in the garden centers, but as we go through 2021, you're gonna see more of it in the stores. This next plant, uh, is a really interesting prunus. I'll bet most of you know purple sand cherry, purple leaf sand cherry, which has been grown for many, many years in the landscape trade and in people's gardens. But this is a green leaf prunus that was developed by Dr. Mark Brand out at the University of Connecticut. And while we think this is gonna be more of a landscaper's plant, there are some uses for homeowners. If you have areas where you need to put some mass planting, um, if you need to hold a hill, uh, we see this as a great alternative to grow low sumac, which is used in many of those situations. And so this slide gives you all the pertinent information. This is a low spreading shrub, only two to four foot in height, but easily six to eight foot in spread. So again, if you have big spaces that you wanna fill with a mass planting, this is a great plant, hardy in zone four, loves full sun. Uh, in the next picture, you're gonna see the arching habit of it. And it looks great seasonally. It, here's the white flower in the spring. Then it has beautiful glossy foliage in the summer and the fall color on the leaves is a beautiful burgundy red. I don't have a picture of that, but come on next picture, hurry up. 
There it is. Oh, I went too much. Hold on. Go back. Here it is. So that picture on the right, you know what's really interesting is in the winter when we get heavy snow cover, those branches get pressed down to the ground. It's like they're they're smooshed right down to the ground. But then spring comes and the sap starts flowing and they slowly start coming up and giving you that arching habit and then the flower buds come on. It's just the sweetest little white flower. So uh, something new and interesting for more of a landscape use. Here's a new azalea from the University of Minnesota. We work with the breeders there all the time. And I'll bet many of you grow some kind of lights azalea. Those were developed by Dr. Pellet many years ago. And his breeding work was carried on by Dr. Stan Hokinson. And Stan reached out to us and offered us a couple plants. You know, many of these shrubs that I've showed you, I haven't even talked about the brand. They are in our first editions brand. So if you go to the garden center, you'll see all these plants in the bright purple pot with a very snazzy little tag on them. And so kind of in honor of the old series, we decided to call ours electric lights. And so far we have two colors. This one uh, is their red one. And it's, it's just a stunning kind of a fire engine, true red color. It's an upright plant that goes about four to five foot tall and three to four foot wide. I think this next slide will really give you a flavor for what it looks like in spring. The azaleas will be blooming very, very soon here in early May. Uh, we've learned a lot of things about the lights azaleas over the last 25, 30 years that they've been on the market. Initially, we thought they absolutely had to be planted in the shade, and we've learned that they are far more sun tolerant than we give them credit for. So think about that when you place them, they tolerate more sun. They do like acid soil. So uh, if you know your soil pH and if, it, if it's alkaline, you may wanna do a little adjustment to your soil to bring the pH down, whether it's some peat moss, uh, some elemental soil sulfur or something like that. But this thing, just has the greatest red flower on it early in the spring. There is a pink one in our series as well. It's a double pink called Electric Lights Double Pink. Both of these are now readily available in the garden center. We had a few problems getting red on the market, but we have been able to fix that problem and get them out there. So if you went shopping in the next week or, week or so at a local garden center, you would find those. This is, uh, I have a couple new spireas to show you. Very useful plants in Minnesota landscapes, again, from a size standpoint. I have one summer blooming spirea, which is this one right here, little spark, and then I have a spring bloomer to show you. So this plant came from our, our breeder friends in France, and we're bringing this in because one of the old industry standards, spirea gold flame, has started to have some problems uh, culturally. It reverts uh, back to this weird uh, looking variegation that actually looks like it's full of virus. It's very hard to propagate. And so we're gonna leave that old one behind and get rid of it and move to Little Spark. Again, a compact plant for small spaces that only gets about two foot tall and a little bit wider than that. This will start blooming for you in June has some very nice chartreuse foliage. When the new growth comes on, there are some red tips to that new growth. And you'll see that in the next slide as I move to it, here it comes. And that red is mostly prevalent in the new growth. And then it kind of mellows out into that limey chartreuse color. And you get those rose colored flowers throughout much of the summer. If you take a little time to deadhead a summer flowering spirea, if you're into that, you will stimulate more flowers later in the season, August to September. So when they start to turn brown and get old, prune them off a little bit and you will get more flowers later in the season. So that is Little Spark. Here is a different species that we don't grow too much here. This is a, a variety called Spot On. And it's actually an interspecific cross, but it has Fritchiana in it, which is a very um, hardy plant. 
This picture that I'm showing you are actually two plants growing side by side in our trial block down at the greenhouse range. And it blooms in late May, early June, very large flowers that are a pink color. Now, some of you might know a variety called Spirea tor, which is white, but this one is pink. And I'm a sucker for anything pink flowering. And um, it was brought to us by a great plantsman in Menominee, Wisconsin called Mike Yanni. He's a super great guy. And, you know, we, we looked at this, you know, we make, we look at a lot of plants that breeders bring us and we go, well, will somebody buy that? Will they like it? And um, one year, I do a lot of meetings in October at the nursery. I run all these meetings. So when they're done, I, I need to get away from the darn computer screen. And uh, a few years ago, I went down and this picture on the upper left, I took, I mean, this plant spoke my name. I, I parked my car over there on the road and I saw that fall, fall color and I walked over and I said, oh my gosh, this is the best fall color I have ever seen on a spirea. It's just, just truly outstanding. And that was kind of the motivation for us to introduce this plant. And so there's a close up of the flower, the fall color. In the middle of the summer, that lower left picture, it's done blooming. You don't really have to deadhead it or anything. The flowers just kind of fade out. The one thing about this plant that, that we've had some good laughs over is uh, in the summer, we'll get some red splotches on the leaves, very irregular splotches. And that made us sit back and go, hmm, what's wrong with this plant? We tested it. We looked at it from a disease standpoint. It's just a natural thing with the plant. And as a matter of fact, Mike Yanni, who's kind of a wild and crazy guy, he wanted to name this plant Dracula's Drippings because of those red splotches. And I looked at him, I said, Mike, we are not putting a plant on the market called Dracula's Drippings. So I put him in his place jokingly and he came up with the name Spot On. So this is Spot On Spirea in our first editions program. There's always a good story or two behind a, a new plant. I consider shrub roses shrubs. So I thought I would show you at least one good one. This is in our Easy Elegance program. And it's a variety called Funny Face. You know, many years ago, we had a full-time breeder out at our farm in Oregon um, who brought a lot of great plants to our Easy Elegance program. The one thing, his name was Ping Lim. He was from Taiwan, really super great breeder. And the one thing he brought to us were some zone four hardy shrub roses that had just fabulous disease resistance. And they had remontant or reblooming traits. So they would start blooming in June, take a little rest, bloom some more, take a little rest, bloom some more. And this is funny face. And I'll say, I've already told you once, I'm a sucker for anything pink. So this is a pink and white bicolor. And as a matter of fact, these pictures that I'm moving to right now were taken in Gordy Bailey's yard. He has always been a fan of this plant. What you need to know about anything Easy Elegance is they're grown on their own root, so they're not grafted roses. This just really helps with the hardiness. If they die back a little bit, you just go in there with your pruning shears and you cut out the dead stems. They're almost all compact varieties that get around three, four foot tall at the max and about the same width. I find that great for foundations. Gordy has these around the pool in the backyard and they do exceptionally well. They mix great in perennial gardens. So there's Funny Face Rose, a very, very easy rose to grow. No spring necessary, no winter cover necessary. That's what we Minnesotans need in a shrub rose. Here's a, here's a privet. Ligustrum, and it's called Straight Talk. This is also in our first editions program. And this came to us from a really good nurseryman in Colorado. Now, many privet species are not hardy in zone four, but if you go into zone five and six, they are used across the country in massive quantities for hedges, pruned hedges, unpruned hedges. This is, and many of them are yellow. Um, yellow leaf. This is a green leaf form, a very upright form. Um, and really, it, it doesn't have a lot of color. It's a green upright shrub. 
what we really thought this plant would be great for would be a substitute for many of us gardeners that have used columnar buckthorn in the past and have not been able to buy columnar buckthorn for many years because buckthorn was banned as a noxious weed. And those are two of our salespeople. Our salespeople love uh, like us from straight talk. So the foliage looks like it's evergreen. It's very glossy, it's very thick, but in Minnesota, it does turn yellow in the fall and it drops its leaves. Other than that, it's an upright shrub. It can get eight to 10 foot tall. The nurseryman in Colorado we got it from has a hedge in his yard. He keeps, he keeps it pruned off at three foot. So it's very, very versatile for smaller spaces. Here's a new dogwood called Neon Burst. I do like a chartreuse shrub in the landscape, but I like them used sparingly so they really accent other things in your garden. And this is, there are some other yellow dogwoods in the marketplace, but they don't tolerate full sun. And that's exactly what this plant does. It is yellow in full sun, but it does not burn. And it's not horribly big, about six foot tall, six foot wide. This is uh, this actually came from a nurseryman in British Columbia, but in the colder part of British Columbia. If you can see there, look at the new growth. It has some nice color to it, a little bit of reddish growth to it. Again, that matures out, but you have a great chartreuse plant that stays yellow all summer long and doesn't bloom or doesn't burn burn, excuse me, in, in the Minnesota heat. Here's a great new lilac. When I came to, uh, to Bailey Nurseries, I was hired by Don Sellinger, who was a super great plantsman. And when he retired in 2000, he started doing some breeding for us in his retirement. And we have introduced a couple of his varieties. And this is a, uh, a French hybrid lilac uh, well, it has some French hybrid in its blood and some other species called virtual violet. And what we really like about vir virtual violet, besides those flowers, it's really hard to photograph, but the new growth about the top six inches, the leaves have purple color to them and the stems are a really rich, dark purple, which really accents the flowers when it blooms. So mine is in bud right now. I suspect, well, it's going to be cool this week. I'll bet in a week, it's going to be fabulous, has this great purple flower to it, which looks super against uh, that purple foliage. It doesn't hold that purple foliage all season long. When it's done blooming, it's done blooming for the year, and then that purple foliage turns green. And here's one of my favorite pictures. You know, you all notice, I think many of these plants have been patented and trademarked. That's Penny on the right with Lacey, her assistant, um, filling out all the color information for the patent, but some plants that we have at the main office. And just to show you, this one is a little more upright in form. It's taller than wider. So it's great for smaller space, uh, informal hedges. So think about using it in that way. Well, the gardening world is all abuzz with hydrangeas. I probably could have done a talk and showed you 50 new hydrangeas. Doesn't matter what species it is, but I have some to show you as well. And um, we work with a paniculata breeder in France. His name is Mr. Jean Renault. And Mr. Renault, I believe is 97 years young this year. And I actually just wrote my July, August plant to pick article uh, for Northern Gardener, and this is the plant that I wrote about. This is uh, the, the fourth hydrangea that we've gotten from Mr. Renault, and it's called Berry White. Um, and I'll bet many of you, the first one we got from him was Vanilla Strawberry, which is really caught on in the industry, and a lot of people like Vanilla Strawberry. To me, this is Vanilla Strawberry on steroids. It's very similar in height and spread, about six to seven foot tall, four to five foot wide, but it's a little more upright and the stems are much stiffer and the flower color is a little better. So let me walk you through some pictures. While I haven't been to Europe in a couple of years, I'll get back there either this year or next year. This is what it looks like in France where the summer uh, temperatures are a little cooler. So the, the colors are fabulous. You know, the panicle hydrangeas for us start blooming in July with that cone-shaped flower that starts out white. 
And then at the bottom of the cone, you get the pink tones and then they intensify and they move up the panicle. And on berry white, they move up all the way. Now this color is stimulated by cool night temperatures. And the last couple summers in Minnesota, in the Twin Cities, the conditions have been perfection for that. So these two pictures were taken down at the range in Cottage Grove. So the picture on the left is the color just starting to come on in mid-July. Picture on the right, you can't hardly see a bit of white on it. The red just moves its way up. So it's a, they're so, these are the easiest to grow, the panicles. I cut mine back every spring about 30%, sometimes more. That makes nice, big, thick stems and they don't flop in the rain or when you put your oscillating sprinkler on the garden like I do. So berry white is just a great new plant. And here's probably one of my favorite pictures. There's Mr. Renault a few years ago standing in a block of containerized berry white. So go look for that. It's, it's much more available in the garden centers now. It's a pretty new introduction. This is also one of Mr. Renault's that came out uh, just before Barry White, if, Barry White a few years ago, it's called Diamond Rouge. This one actually, when it does color up, is the most red. If you were to place Barry White when it's reddish and Diamond Rouge, Diamond Rouge would be more fire engine color. And so it's a little shorter, only gets about four to five foot tall. And this is a trend you guys are gonna start to see as you see all these, so many new varieties, Proven Winners has a ton of them, that you're gonna see some dwarfer varieties. So for those of you that have smaller spaces, look for these smaller ones that get three to four to five foot tall. So here it is in France. And this was in their nursery in France. They had shipped all the Diamond Rouge except this last row of them. And that would have been in late August when I took that picture. You can just see the intensity of the red. So lots of great new hydrangeas out there. Here's a new nine bark that came from the University of Minnesota called Fireside. That name might remind you of something if you know the apple variety, Fireside, they named it. We really like this nine bark a lot. It is a little slower growing than some of the other varieties that are out there like Diablo, which is kind of the industry standard. And we like that because it just doesn't take so much space in the garden. The plants, that top right picture is down in Cottage Grove. It, it really hasn't gotten much taller than five foot tall. It has kind of an upright vase shape to it. It loves full sun. And what we like about this one, it's hard to photograph, but I think you can see it in that bottom right picture. It has more reddish tones to it rather than the brownish purple tones like Diablo or Little Devil have. And oh, when the sunlight is flowing through it, it's just incredible. So uh, it, it's a nice addition to all the nine barks that are out there. You know, the one thing we've noticed in the last few years is that the nine barks can get powdery mildew, especially if we have a wet, humid season. I can't, I'm not gonna lie, we've seen a tiny bit of it on fireside, but it's not as susceptible as other varieties out there. So that one's also in first edition. Here's a new proven winter plant that you might find in the garden center. Um, they have a lot of spirea that were bred by Dr. Tom Rainey out at North Carolina State. This is such a colorful little thing and they pick such a great name. It's called candy corn. It's a summer blooming spirea. Only it's really small, only a foot and a half to two and a half foot tall and wide, zone four hardy, really multicolored. And this next picture kind of shows it to you. So when it's emerging, you get red, then orange, then peach, then chartreuse, and the inner leaves are kind of limey green. Can you see how the inner leaves are limey green? And then you do get that, that um, pink flower on it that starts to come on in June. And just like Little Spark, if you do deadhead a little bit, you will stimulate more flowers. So here's just a colorful little shrub. You will wanna put this thing in full sun in order to really get those color tones out of the foliage. And it does quite well in full sun. It's kind of a hard plant to grow in the nursery, but once you get it in your garden, it's a 
really cool little plant. And you know, not new, but I always have to throw in, uh, this is one of the first shrub introductions that we ever made at Bailey Nurseries, not quite the first, but it's become so popular and it's really fun to drive around or go to garden tours in the Twin Cities and see Tiger Eye Sumac. And there I am with my face in a Tiger Eye Sumac. And you know, it's being used in a lot of situations. Uh, it does sucker a little bit, but it does have great color, uh, yellow color throughout the season, great fall color ranging from orange to red. We, there it is at the main office at Bailey Nursery. You can see it's uh, in late summer, hasn't burned at all next to the mammoth mum that it's next to. So I always like to mention it because it really has turned out to be a great performing variety for many gardeners in the Twin Cities. Okay, I'm back into hydrangea country. So I don't want anybody to say endless bummer because I'm just gonna talk about endless summer, okay? So, you know, back in 2004, that many years ago, we introduced Endless Summer Original, the first reblooming hydrangea macrophylla, a plant that bloomed on both old wood and new wood. And while I will be the first to admit that original, I don't want any of you to buy an original. It's better in zone five and six. We have been breeding macrophyllas and introducing new varieties into our Endless Summer program. And this is the newest one. It's called Summer Crush. Well, the pink flowers, you know, the, I love those pink flowers. So this is what Summer Crush looks like. And um, this is how it's going to be in the container when you find it in the garden center. I have a plant here. I live in South St. Paul. I brought one of the original propagated plants home. It's been in my garden for eight years and every year it consistent, consistently blooms. So it, ha it has some parentage in it that makes it a little hardier than some of the first varieties that we introduced in Endless Summer. So I have lots of fun. It's great in a pot, but if, you know, a lot of them are out in the garden centers right now down at the greenhouse range in Cottage Grove. We grow 20,000 of these and we ship them out to garden center customers all over the upper Midwest. If you go buy one right now, it will bloom in that pot all season long. I hope you can notice the new buds coming. You know, the big flowers are blooming, but you see the new buds that are forming on those plants. So it is a remonted bloomer. If you would like to manipulate flower color, you can. At work, we lovingly call this color blurple, which is kind of a cross between blue and purple. But you know, in Minnesota, we have naturally alkaline soils. So if you get one that's pink in the pot and you plop it in your garden there in St. Anthony, you're gonna get that pink color there. So gosh, I put way too many slides. And here are the two colors side by side. So the marketing department calls it red. I call it raspberry red. And we did test the heck out of this plant, you guys. This again is the test block down in Cottage Grove. Uh, this is bloom on old wood, so flowers that were formed the year before, and then it kept blooming on the new wood that came up, so flowers later in the summer. And just because I'm product development manager and I'm privy to all the new stuff, I'm going to show you something, I'm gonna show you a couple really new things that you can't get yet, so don't throw rotten eggs at me. I guess that's a nice thing about a Zoom meeting. So this is the next Endless Summer. We, are, we haven't even named this plant yet. We're working on a, a, a fun little name on it. This is a lace cap hydrangea macrophylla. And what you're gonna see in the Bailey breeding, Summer Crush, this one, and other things coming down the road is we have more compact plants with tighter inner nodes. And of course, we're always trying to improve, improve the bloom load on these. This is the best re-blooming hydrangea we've ever developed. This was bred, we have a breeding farm down in Athens, Georgia. I am gonna get up and take a 5.30 flight tomorrow morning to go there for the first time since September of 19 to see all the hydrangea breeding. But we're really excited about this plant. Like all macrophyllas, the flower color is affected by the soil pH. So the pink in alkaline, the blue in acid soils. So I, I will tell you honestly that I think it's kind of hard 
to manipulate to blue in Minnesota soils, but I'll bet some of you green thumbers can get it done. So a really heavy bloomer blooming on both old wood and new wood. A new paniculata that's coming out, you will find this plant in a garden center, I'm hoping in August of 21. And um, this is a plant I can see, oh, the, the cultivar name is on there and it should have single quotes. This plant is gonna be called Little Hottie. This is a very compact paniculata. There it is down in Cottage Grove. It's gonna go about three to four foot tall, three to four foot wide. Again, with those classic panicle, the cone-shaped flowers that come on in July. This one doesn't have a ton of pink color. Takes on a little bit of pink, but when it first emerges, it has some pretty cool lime green color to it. So that's a brand new plant that's coming. Wait till August and you'll see it in the garden center. And this last one you will see next year uh, from the same breeder of that little lady. Here's another compact lilac, but this is a Preston hybrid. I don't know if any of you have grown Preston hybrids. Uh, the most commonly grown one is called Miss Canada. And that was one of the parents. This is a compact form of Miss Canada. It only gets about four to five foot tall and three to four foot wide. And you can see the, the Preston foliage there. It's a very unique foliage. It's quite different from the French hybrids. Uh, and it, they bloom a little bit later than the French hybrids. So you can kind of expand out your lilac bloom season if you pick some of these other species, but a great pink flower that blooms in June. This will be next year. It might be late in 22, we're working hard. Sometimes lilacs are a little tricky to propagate in the nursery. So I always like to tease you with some new things, but uh, some things you can look for in the future. And with that, I say thank you very much for having me via Zoom. I hope that at least one of these plants put a smile on your face or perhaps motivated you to go out and get a new shrub to put in your yard. So I thank you for that. And I think uh, I'll hand it back to Virgil or whoever is maybe gonna handle some of the chat questions. And in the meantime, I'm gonna shut, shut down my slideshow. Wonderful, Debbie. Thank you so much. And I think uh, since I lost internet two or three times, I think Sue is, uh, has been monitoring the chat so she can talk to us. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Debbie. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm inspired. I need some new little shrubs. So thank you for sharing those and for spending your evening with us. Um, <laughs> Uh, when you're getting up so early tomorrow morning. So I'm going to start with a question that I had. Um, it does look like you're still sharing the screen. Oh, here, let me hit stop share. Oh, way better, way better. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my question was about the, the first one that you talked about, the Tianshan Seven Sunflower. Yes. Um, so, to, you know, in the during the our our in between our social hour, we were talking a little bit about invasives and you know that or and you mentioned also like the buckthorn and things. Do we have to worry at all about something that's wasn't that isn't native to North America? Um, like, is there a way that when you're when you're when you're when you're getting ready to put in new um, listings that you're monitoring that kind of? Yes. Yes, it's a very fair question and we think about it a lot. We don't want to introduce invasive plants. Um, but the thing about Tianxin is the straight species has been in the United States. You know, plant hunters have gone to Asia to collect Asian plant species for years and years. And so straight species Hepticodium has been in the U.S. for quite a long time. And I've not seen that plant uh, break out and seed itself out and become a noxious weed. Now, the one thing that we have a tendency to do, I think I pointed out a few times to you guys, that trial block down in Cottage Grove. We mm -hmm. test things for as long as I can physically get away with it. I do get a little pushback 
from our brand manager and our marketing department because they just they want more plants. Let's introduce more plants. And I say, we're going to test it and test it properly. And so like that, uh, I didn't have the picture of that full plant down there, but it's been there for 10 years. We've never seen a seedling germinate underneath it. And those are the kind of things we are constantly looking for in our test process. Thank you. That's great to know. Yeah. Um, so I see that there is a question from Debbie Smith. Um, anything, are there any of the, the shrubs that you've mentioned that will do well in partial shade? Well, of course, any hydrangea macrophylla should be put in partial shade. Uh, the spireas are actually far more shade tolerant than we give them credit for. Partial shade is great, not deep shade. They'll live, but they won't uh, flower a lot. That little uh, sorberia will tolerate some light shade quite nicely. The azalea, the electric light, electric lights red, will tolerate partial shade quite nicely as well. And I would say those are the most shade tolerant things in my talk tonight. That's great. St. Anthony Park has a lot of trees, so people are always looking for partial shady kind of things. So sure. Um, sure. that is great. Uh, so I am not seeing any more questions. Um, I will ask my, I have one more question and then um, also, if people want to raise their hands in Zoom or, oh, um, okay, Carol, I'll, why don't we go to Carol and you can just ask your question out loud. Carol, you have to unmute. Yeah, Carol, can you unmute, can you hit the unmute button? I am unmuted. However, oh. I, I don't have a question. Oh, oh. <laughs> it, it's Carol. me. It's a okay. different Carol, okay. <laughs> Hi, I was just wondering if what Bailey's policy is on the use of neonics in their um, plants that they grow. Yep. Um, our policy, uh, I can say that we use a tiny bit of neonics uh, where some of our farms are, are out in the middle of farm fields and woodbury and stuff, but it's a very minimal amount. The plant health guys have been working quite hard over the last five years to minimize uh, the use of any of it. Um, so, but there's a little bit there. Is it in a particular kind of shrub or? It probably is, Carol, but you know, we are a really large company and yes. we're we're quite departmentalized mm -hmm. and, and that's all part of the plant health group guys. I bet if I call Jean-Marc, I said, what do you use a neonic on? In a heartbeat, he'd tell me, but I actually don't know that for a fact. Okay. So I couldn't tell you. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anne, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I love the uh, Panicula Lata hydrangeas. Are, mm -hmm. They only zone four or would one survive in zone three? I'm thinking of my cabin, which is zone three. Actually, I, I am of the personal opinion that almost every paniculata is zone three hardy. I think in some cases we have a tendency to be a little bit conservative on the zones because we know for a fact we've tested it. Um, but we do have, um, we do work with a few universities and botanical gardens around the country and we test plants. So for example, we send things up to North Dakota State and um, they're on campus there and then they're out at their really cold site in Absaraka. So like we just sent little hottie up there and in a couple years, if everything goes great up there, we'll change the zone to three. So if if you are going to try something in zone three, it probably should be in more sun than shade, I would imagine. Well, if you're going to try a paniculata, I would recommend that you put it in a site that has a minimum of six hours of direct sunlight a day. And, you know, it doesn't have to have all day, but it has to have at least that. It will probably live in shadier sites, but the flower power will be really greatly diminished. And the whole reason you're growing that plant is for the flower power. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else that wanted to 
ask a question. I see in the um, chat, uh, Debbie's asking, can you spell the first one, the Tianxin uh, oh, sure. flower? Sure. Well, the cultivar is Tianxin. It's spelled T I A N S H E N. And, and the botanical name is Hepticodium. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it's a, you know, the one thing I didn't say, it's one of those ugly duckling plants. So if you see it in the garden center, like right now, you're going to think that's the ugliest thing I ever seen in a pot. Because right now is not when it really shines. And it's not this perfect little shrubby thing. It's kind of got an arm here and an arm there. So it's one of those plants you have to have faith that once you get it in the garden and you have a few years on it, it's going to turn into the graceful swan that it is. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a lot of nurseries try to introduce plants that are just perfect little miniature forms of themselves in a pot so that people will impulsively buy them in the garden center which is really too bad because there's a lot of ugly stuff at the garden centers because it's going to turn into fabulous things if you give it a little bit of faith in your own garden. And Tian Shen totally fits that bill. It's an ugly duckling today. I like that. I like yeah. that. Um, is there anybody else that wants to answer, ask a question? Um, you can either unmute or raise your hand. I have a question in the meantime. Um, so the tiger eye sumac, for me, it kind of, uh, I, I garden in a friend's garden and it's actually started to sucker quite a bit now. Oh. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas for how to kind of nip that in the bud. Well, you what you do is you nip that in the bud early in the season when, when it's just, when those suckers are coming out of the ground two, three inches, you take your spade, you sharpen your spade, and you whack them off there. That that's you know, oh, I was just who's on grow with care? Sixty thousand people with lots of bad information, and somebody showed a picture of it, and somebody said spray it with Roundup, and I wrote, <gasps> no, no, don't do that because it will translocate to the main plant. So you know, unfortunately, when you have some suckering things, you have to get in there physically. And to me, a good sharp spade, like I have a, there's another sorberia out there called um, Sem, Sorberia Sem. And unlike our matcha ball, it suckers. It's one of the first things I do in the spring. I go out there with my spade and I start whacking and pulling those suckers out and controlling them early on in the season. Because the underground rhizomes are really soft then, and they're really easy to cut through. If you wait till August, they've hardened off and they've become really woody and they're hard to get your spade through. So like right now would be a perfect time to go spade out the suckers of tiger eyes. That, that's great advice. For me, it, it always is one of the things that I end up leaving and, you know, until later, cause there's other things that seem like yeah. I should do first. So I will try that this year. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else with a question? I don't, or is there anything in the chat that I've missed? I don't think so. No. It's been fantastic. And your dedication to presenting to us when you're getting up at O oh, Dark 100 and leaving. <laughs> uh, I think I booked it. I think I booked you guys first before that trip. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, we're very grateful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy to speak to your group. I'm hope you're all having a good spring and that we continue to have a good spring and a good gardening year. And it's been fun to show you all these new things. So thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to hit the leave button now. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night. Thank you.